Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to another China History Podcast episode. Laszlo Montgomery bringing you number 230 this time. I intended for the title of this episode to be just plain old Chi Chi Guang, but once again, my marketing team stepped in and whispered into upper management's ear that the title needed to be jazzed up a bit. Hence the sensationalist appellation of today's episode. Not my idea. But Mongols and pirates were pretty central to the life of Chi Chi Guang, so it's not entirely out of line to mention these two groups in the title. Anyway, to those of you who thought, gee, Laszlo, you always have such boring titles to all your episodes. I had nothing to do with this. You know, not including the mythical age, from about the time of recorded Chinese history to now, more than 30 centuries, there have been a lot of heroes. Military heroes, hero kings, hero peasants, and all manners of men and women who rose to the occasion at some key moment in Chinese history to do something that earned them a mention in the official histories, or in poems, opera, and even cinema. For such a long and continuous history as China's, it's not surprising that so many of these greats are relatively unknown. How can you remember them all? Chi Chi Guang, I would not call him unknown. In China, he's a pretty major Minzu Yingxiong, or national hero. I suppose his achievements perhaps get mentioned in the schools, maybe not. He's not a headliner like some of the other military greats, but in his time, mid to late 16th century, the years marking the decline of the Ming Dynasty, he was a VIP, a major figure. And by looking at his life and achievements from the 1550s till his end came in 1588, it allows us to revisit that time in the Ming Dynasty covering the three reigns of emperors Jia Qing, Long Qing, and Wan Li. In those times when the Ming Dynasty was in crisis and began to allow that mandate of heaven to slip through their fingers. The Ming Dynasty only lasted 56 years beyond the death of Qi Qi Guang. Pretty much by the time Qi Qi Guang began his military career, the best years of the Ming Dynasty you know, were already in the rearview mirror. And also, in looking at Qi Qi Guang's life, we can zoom in on the most famous years of piracy on the China coast and how he fought off these Wakou, or dwarf bandits, or pirates. The history of the Wakou. It is a long and complicated one. What we'll look at today is just a small part of a bigger story. A story that maybe we'll save for a later day. Chi Chi Guang, Sun Yat-sen, Karl Marx, Neil Young, Tanya Harding, and Charles Manson all had one thing in common. They were all born on November 12th. Chi Chi Guang was born in 1528, a century after Admiral Zheng He's amazing voyages with that magnificent fleet and all those treasure ships. The fortunes of the Ming Dynasty by the mid-16th century had declined a bit since those glory days. Some of you may recall I featured a three-part series on Zheng He, CHP episodes 92, 93, 94. Chi Ji Guang grew up during the long reign of the Jia Qing Emperor. His birthplace was Penglai in Shandong province. It used to be called Dengzhou. It's part of the city of Yantai today. One of his illustrious forebears, a sixth-generation ancestor, fought alongside Zhu Yuanzhang in his conquest of China, wresting control away from the Mongols. And for this act of service and loyalty to the founding emperor of the Ming, fighting for him and dying down in Yunnan in 1382... This ancestor received a hereditary post at Dengzhou Garrison. Qi Ji Guang's father, Qi Jing Tong, was also a soldier as well as an official. And just like his father and grandfather before him, he filled that commander-in-chief role at the Dengzhou Garrison. And with his father's passing in 1544, this hereditary position of leadership was passed on to 17-year-old Chi Chi Guang, and his military career was off and running. For those who aspired to greatness in a military career rather than one in the civil service, there was a different imperial exam to take. 
and how you feared in these military imperial exams determined how fast out of the starting gate you might be with your military career. As a cadet studying for the exam in Beijing in 1548, Qi Qi Guang received his first test in battle when the Mongols came calling from the north. Zhu Yuanzhang led the forces that brought an end to the Mongol Yuan Dynasty, 1368. Who ever thought those fearsome people from the steppes of Mongolia could ever be beat? From Temujin, uniting all the tribes in 1206, until 1368, the Mongols had had a spectacular 162-year run. However, their end finally did come, and they were pushed north out of China, back into their traditional homelands. But they didn't go away. They may not have had that trophy Chinese dynasty anymore, but they still remained a menace. And by this time, late 1540s in northern China, they started to feel around the edges of the Ming Empire and found the place to be looking quite soft. The nemesis of the Jiajing Emperor was Altan Khan. He had been raiding North China since the late 1520s. Mongol raids in 1542 proved the Ming army wasn't what it used to be. In 1550, after a few incursions that further proved Ming defenses were wanting, Altan Khan led 100,000 Mongol troops south in the direction of Beijing. Our hero, Qi Qi Guang, just happened to be on duty, serving as a cadet when all this was going on. And he, along with 380,000 other Ming troops, had to contend with this Mongol invasion. And when the Khan's troops got to the Great Wall, which was mostly made of rammed earth and easily destroyed if you threw enough Mongol soldiers at the problem, they broke right through. And anyone who has ever done a day tripper to the Great Wall from Beijing knows it's not that far away. The Mongol troops overran the Beijing suburbs and trashed the place, burning many parts to the ground. As many as 60,000 Chinese troops would be killed and 40,000 taken prisoner, and any livestock that wasn't hidden deep underground or out of sight were snatched and herded back to Mongolia. One historian called this event in 1550 the 9-11 of Ming history. Quite a wake-up call it was. In October of that year, one of these captured Chinese prisoners was sent by the Mongols with a message for the Jiajing Emperor. All these years before, the Mongols had been trying to cut a trade deal with China, but had always been rebuffed and disrespected. Now, with the Altan Khan's troops poised to inflict some serious damage to the capital, it was decided to go down the path of appeasement. To do that, the Ming court caved in to the Khan, giving him something he wanted, had been promised, but never given. A nice, favorable trade deal between his Mongol nation and the Ming Empire. That and a few other cherries on top diffuse that situation. Qi Qi Guang had learned from this debacle that the Chinese army up in Beijing, with numbers as great as they had, almost 400,000 troops, well, most of them were unreliable, undisciplined, and had received no proper training. And many were old and past their sell-by date. It was no wonder the Mongol troops, with all their Discipline and centuries of fighting experience ran roughshod over these Ming troops. Young Qi Qi Guang in his early 20s had fought valiantly in defense of the capital, and his efforts were noticed, and this led to his first big opportunity. This came in the spring of 1553 when he was sent to his home province of Shandong as assistant regional military commander. His mission was to deal with the threat to the coast from these Wako. These pirates had at first mostly been former Japanese samurai who, during Japan's Sengoku period, had turned to piracy following the defeat of their respective daimyos. But by the time of Qi Ji Guang, the ranks of Wako pirates was filled to the brim with Chinese who figured, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. Qi Ji Guang found the same thing in Shandong that he found at the capital. Troops were weak undisciplined and poorly trained, if they were trained at all. In many conflicts, there would be 
times where the Imperial troops had collaborated with the pirates. These were the tools Chi Chi Guang had to work with to fight off the pirates pillaging the coast with impunity. He didn't meet with much success, but it was another good learning experience. This is when Chi Chi Guang had the brainstorm to take stock of everything and devise some way to methodically whip these soldiers into shape. He had already earned the reputation as a sober, no-nonsense leader who had already proved himself in battle and who was a painful stickler for the highest levels of discipline and training. In 1555, he was sent down to Zhejiang province to deal with this long-standing problem of piracy that had plagued the China coast on and off since about the time of the northern and southern dynasties. He carried the rank of full commander. From this experience, facing off against these Wako pirates in Ningbo, Shaoxing, Taizhou, he faced the same old difficulties as everywhere else. These poorly trained and unruly troops were consistently no match for the highly disciplined and organized pirates who worked as a team to achieve one victory after another, even though most of the time they were greatly outnumbered by imperial troops. In Zhejiang, Chi Chi Guang learned that these troops were mostly drawn from urban areas. They had no skin in the game and often weren't the ones the pirates plundered. It was always the rural villagers who faced their might and who had the most to lose from the Wako problem. And so it was to the countryside that Chi Chi Guang went to draw from the pool of potential recruits. And he turned these villagers, these farmers, into fighters. And it was to the city of Iwu where he went. That's where he tested this theory he had. That's where he would institute this training regimen. And that city today is one of China's largest and greatest markets to the world of all kinds of general merchandise. In Iwu, central Zhejiang province, Chi Chi Guang began writing the book that would act as a training manual and which would earn him praise throughout the remainder of imperial Chinese history and into our modern age. This work was the Ji Xiao Xin Shu, the new book on military efficiency. It was a simple and straightforward military training manual. He wrote it as a training guide on how to build a modern fighting machine from the ground up that could rise to any occasion and take on those who threaten China. And their first test case were the Wako of Zhejiang province. This Ji Xiao Xin Shu showed how to create a people's army, and it hammered away at the message that training and obeying the orders of your commanding officer would yield positive results on the field of battle. It taught how to make many work as one. And as far as the training went, Chi Chi Guang broke it down to the most simple and basic level, using plain language written in verse so that people, no matter literate or illiterate, could remember it. And it included illustrations as well. It was meant to be a no-nonsense guide that could be used to train and organize peasants, miners, and other rural villagers. They were transformed into disciplined soldiers capable of defending their own home turf. That was key here. They weren't being trained to go fight some hill tribe out in Guizhou or Yunnan. These skills learned from this training helped them to defend themselves against others from outside China who came to attack them and seize their property and make their lives miserable. Chi Ji Guang knew you had to use these country guys. City folk were unreliable, lazy, and in a way, incorrigible. Peasants could be trained. The manual introduced all manners of fighting techniques, including battle formations using five types of infantry, those packing firearms, swordsmen, archers with fire arrows, regular archers, and spearmen. And there were two kinds of support, horse archers and artillery units. Cannon had already been invented by now and had a big impact on warfare in China, as it did elsewhere. In the world of martial arts, this book has a particular significance. The Ji Xiao Xin Shu was the earliest known text that mentions the use of martial arts in both training and warfare. In chapter 14 
of the book is the title Quan Jing Jie Yao Pian, The Fist Cannon and the Essentials of Nimbleness. This chapter dealt with unarmed combat in training and practice. Qi Ji Guang believed unarmed combat, no matter how well it was practiced, was a dubious match for armed and organized pirates. Although soldiers who trained under him were taught unarmed fighting techniques, what Qi Ji Guang saw was the value in using these wushu martial arts exercises and stances as a means to train and teach discipline, and turning many into a single unit that moved as one. I'm sure you've seen it in kung fu movies or... Perhaps you've seen it in your own martial arts experience, how you'll have rows and rows of students lined up, and they're all following the Sifu's every move, and they punch, kick, and execute moves in unison. That all started with Chi Chi Guang and this new book on military efficiency. In this chapter, he itemized a total of 32 of the most known stances and fighting positions selected from several major styles of the day. Qi Ji Guang was the first who incorporated Chinese martial arts into the military and wrote about how to do it, step by step. This wasn't the first military treatise, not by a long shot. Sun Tzu's Art of War had already been out for more than 20 centuries by the time Qi Ji Guang first laid his eyes on it. But up to this time, the great military works were like the Art of War, long on theory and overall strategy, in short, on details and actual practice. In the new book on military efficiency, Qi Ji Guang introduced what became known as the Mandarin Duck Formation, the Yunyang Jun. A Jun is a battle formation. It consisted of a leader, two shield men, two who carried bamboo lances, four long lances, two fork men who, who carried a kind of trident, and a cook or porter. This was the most basic unit of ten men. They would advance in two five-man columns, and they had to protect the leader at all costs. Qi Ji Guang maintained the officer was responsible for his squad, and the squad was responsible to keep the officer alive. If the officer died in combat, whoever else from that squad who survived the battle or ambush would also be killed. If your commanding officer was killed, it was game over for you too. Qi Ji Guang had studied the Wako fighting methods, their weapons, formations, strategies. Let me quote Ray Huang from his excellent book that I highly recommend about this time in China history. It's called 1587, A Year of No Significance, The Ming Dynasty in Decline. He said, quote, The invincibility of the Japanese was based on skillful handling of contact weapons, close teamwork within small units the size of platoons and squads. Infantry tactics, in fact, accounted for most of their field performance. The twin swords, in particular, were wielded with such dexterity that onlookers could see only the flash of the weapon, not the man. Chinese observers also noted that the Japanese used bows eight feet long and arrowheads two inches wide, and that their javelins were thrown before they could be seen. End quote. I'll have a link to Ray Huang's book in the show notes. With this Mandarin duck formation, Qi found a way to perfectly counter the Wako fighting styles, and the ten-man formation would serve as the basic fighting unit. Four of the Mandarin duck formations would make up a platoon. Four platoons made up a company, and three companies formed a battalion of about 600 men. And every battalion would also carry firepower in the form of muskets and cannon, all fighting as one. Qi Ji Guang also set up a three-tier defense system that utilized scouts on offshore islands who could provide an early warning to forts located in key cities along the coast. The last line of defense would be soldiers, personally trained and led by Qi Ji Guang, who would rush to the scene of any Wako disturbance on the Zhejiang coast. Martial arts historians all know of this military training manual and how it distilled the most widely known styles from the most well-known schools into one single work. It also introduced the most important techniques and strategies and even discussed specific moves and how to execute them. 
No frills or editorializing. And as I said, it had illustrations as well. And Japanese karate enthusiasts have the bubishi and the Okinawan bubishi. That originated with Chi Chi Guang and the Ji Xiao Xin Shu. This new book on military efficiency. This work was brought to the Ryukyus by a wandering Chinese kung fu master from Fujian. It had a very early influence on modern karate. In addition to all the training techniques, the book touched on a soldier's pay scale. It standardized the organization of combat and battle formations. It clearly outlined the duties of the officers and the soldiers. Banners were designed and signals codified. It discussed tactics as well as military etiquette. And it was this Zhejiang experience, fighting one battle and skirmish after another, that provided the testing ground for the effectiveness of Qi Ji Guang's training methods. During these years in Zhejiang, Qi Ji Guang started working with another major figure of this Jia Jing to Wan Li era. This was Tan Lun. At that time, Tan was the prefect of Taizhou in Zhejiang, and he saw a winner in Qi Ji Guang and he used his power and authority to back him up and support Qi Ji Guang in his efforts. And all the way up to his death, Tan Lun was one of Qi's two main benefactors. By 1559 and into 1560 and 61, Qi Ji Guang, with Tan Lun's political support, cleaned up Taizhou of its Wako menace. So successful was Qi Ji Guang and Zhejiang the pirates decided to move their base of operations to the coastal province to the south, Fujian. From Fu'an in the north to Zhangzhou in the south, the Fujian coast by the 1560s belonged to the Wako. By then, Qi Ji Guang had already had the chance to test out these highly trained recruits on the field of battle. Now it was time to do in Fujian what he had just done in Zhejiang. In 1562, he led 6,000 elite troops that he had had a personal hand in training. He attacked the pirates in their three main lairs near Fuzhou and Zhangzhou. And over the next several years, he put the Wako out of business on the Fujian coast. In 1565, along with another major figure in the battles against the Wakos, Yu Dayo, he went down to the Fujian-Guangdong border off the coast from Shantou to engage the pirates in the Battle of Nanao Island. I spent a rather uncomfortable night there once. Yu Dayo is famous for his journey to Shaolin Temple to learn their wushu techniques and for bringing this skill set to Fujian to aid in the fight against the Wako. Chi Chi Guang might be the most famous of the pirate slayers, but... But Yu Dayo was another one of the military figures from this Jia Jing era when the Wako problem was at its peak. He also fought the Wako in Zhejiang and then in Fujian. There was a movie, in fact, called God of War, Dang Ko Feng Yun, that came out in June 2017. It starred Vincent Zhao, Zhao Wenzhuo, in the role of Qi Ji Guang and the great, with a capital G, Sammo Hong, Hong Gam Bao, as Yu Dayo, while not historically accurate, it's a nice, exciting portrayal of those times. I couldn't find a free version anywhere, but it's all over the place for a small rental price. With 1567 rolling around and the pirate problem resolved and the Zhejiang and Fujian coasts cleared of this scourge at last, the Mongol problem in the north that never went away was starting to heat up again. So late in that year, in November... Qi Ji Guang was called to Jizhou to take over the command of the garrison there. Jizhou was located just east of Beijing and was one of the more heavily fortified areas that defended the capital. There were nine defense areas that kept the capital safe, and this was one of them. This is where Qi had fought early in his career when he was a cadet defending against Altan Khan's invasion during the 1550s. Now he was back with a lot of wind in his sails from all his success in the south, and he was tasked with training the imperial guards up there. And here is where Chi Chi Guang ran up against the imperial bureaucracy. 
And for the rest of his life, he had to deal with all manners of resistance to whatever he was trying to do. Because past history showed that the emperor had to always be wary of generals using their armies to overthrow them. By this time in the Ming Dynasty, you had a very strict civil bureaucracy control over the army. The Board of War called all the shots, including decisions on war plans and even troop movements. This really gummed up Qi's planning, and he needed one or two heavy hitters in the government to go to bat for him and deal with this counterproductive interference. Can you imagine if the U.S. Congress started running field ops in some conflict zone? It's not the most efficient way to run a war. We remember Qi Qi Guang for his role in ridding Zhejiang and Fujian of pirates and for writing the Ji Xiao Xin Shu. Now came the next chapter in his life that we remember him for. After getting the lay of the land and analyzing the best way to defend against Mongol incursions into Chinese territory, he came up with a plan, the likes of which were epic in their scale. This was the work he did, restoring the Great Wall between Shanghai Guan on the Hebei coast all the way to Beijing. By the Ming Dynasty, you know, the Great Wall wasn't so great. As I said, parts of it were just constructed of rammed earth. This may have been good enough a thousand years ago, but in the age of such advanced military weapons and firepower, it didn't provide much of a deterrence to invaders. So in 1567, Chi Chi Guang, along with Tan Lun, who had been called back to the capital to assist in the defense of the north, they began to put a plan together. Tan Lun had been transferred up north first, and he advocated on behalf of Chi Chi Guang to get him assigned to protecting the north and whipping the imperial guard there into shape using his tried and true methods that had been so effective in Zhejiang and Fujian. And that's why, by 1568, Chi Chi Guang found himself in Jizhou, and for the next 15 years, that's where he hung his hat and concentrated his efforts. The Great Wall we know and love today, the parts that were all reconstructed with those iconic-looking, hollowed-out towers that have spawned a billion tourist selfies, this is when that all got built. Those towers, that was Chi Chi Guang, they weren't there before. I mean, there were towers that were manned, but they weren't like what you see today in the tourist spots north of Beijing. This was all Chi Chi Guang's idea to build a series of fortresses, that is, these towers that are part of the Great Wall, most familiar to travelers and in all kinds of media. He said, build a few thousand of those and then join them all together via a single uninterrupted wall without a single gap. That's how you'll stop the Mongols. He said, build all these hollowed out towers and make them from stone, brick and mortar. Forget about rammed earth. The towers could house grain, arms, ammo. Troops could permanently be stationed there. The towers acted as a barracks, gun platforms. Beacons could be used to send signals from tower to tower. And to the delight of artists and painters, Chi Chi Guang insisted that the wall must be built along the ridges of the mountains where they would be most impenetrable. The wall would be 30 feet high and 10 feet wide. It all sounded great. Everyone who's been to Badaling, <laughs> that's quite a sight, isn't it? And expensive looking. The cost to do this was indeed astronomical. This was the Three Gorges Dam of the late Ming. Alton Khan was getting restless with the emperor and all these short-term treaties that were clearly attempts to buy time and keep the Mongols at bay. There had been a change in emperors when Chi Chi Guang arrived in Jizhou. The Jiajing Emperor, after a wonderful 46-year reign, lived long enough to see everything start to fall apart for the dynasty. He was succeeded by his son, the Longqing Emperor, who wasn't destined to live too long. He was untested. When he took over, the Mongols saw a chance to feast on his inexperience. So things were a little dicey in Beijing, and I guess you could say desperate. The military was proving inadequate and ineffective each time Alton Khan's forces would ride south and prod that soft underbelly for weaknesses. 
On paper, the imperial troops that guarded the Ming capital in Beijing looked great, but the reality was quite different. And inside the Forbidden City, the emperor and all his eunuchs and closest officials knew it was only a matter of time before it was 1550 all over again. This was to be the biggest and most expensive civil engineering project of the time, and the Zhu royal family and their Ming dynasty depended on its success. That's why, despite the exorbitant cost, the emperor caved in and greenlighted Qi Qi Guang's Great Wall idea. And in 1569, they started to build the bricks, and the army was converted into a fighting force that also knew how to make bricks, and that's what went on all day and all night. In Qi Qi Guang's mind, this was going to be a 3,000-mile-long wall. So even running these soldiers 24-7 was going to be iffy as far as meeting the demand for bricks. He was given five years and 20,000 workers on top of the soldiers. The Imperial Guard, watching over Beijing, was turned into an army corps of engineers. Qi Qi Guang's plan was sort of a long-term solution to a short-term problem. It was going to take years to carry out this reconstruction plan, but the Altan Khan was already breathing down the emperor's neck. So the Longqing emperor continued on with his father's policy of appeasement and bestowed the title of Lord Shunyi on Altan Khan and took all kinds of actions to keep the Khan's mind off of attacking Beijing. And just a quick tidbit, it was the Altan Khan who was the founder of the city of Hohat, Hu He Haute, the present-day capital of Inner Mongolia. Anyway, by 1575, a year after Qi Qi Guang was given the highest military rank in the empire, and with a new emperor on the throne, the long-lasting Wan Li, the first section of the wall was completed. And it was in March of that year that the Altan Khan and the Mongols decided to test out these new but unfinished defenses that they were no doubt aware of already. He had grown bored with the Lord Shunyi title, which didn't get him what he wanted, so he went back to raiding the north of China. Qi Qi Guang used spotters north of the wall to warn against Mongol encroachment. No one was surprised anymore by a sudden storm of Mongol soldiers. Now they were waiting for them, and this time they saw them coming. Cannon made from bronze and iron had appeared first in China at the end of the 13th century and had become more advanced. New firepower technology introduced from Europe to China had been copied and improved upon. Qi Qi Guang had lined the Great Wall with artillery. And when that wave of Mongol troops appeared, Qi Qi Guang himself led his most elite warriors personally and defeated the Mongols taking many prisoners. Back in Beijing, the naysayers who were complaining about the cost and effectiveness of this massive Great Wall project had to lay low and keep silent. It worked. This wasn't only a political victory for Qi Qi Guang. He couldn't have done this without the backing of Tan Lun, who had been promoted to Minister of War in 1570. And over the next two years, 1,200 or so watchtowers were built between Shanghai Guan, where the wall began, and scenic Juyongguan, a mere hour drive north from Tiananmen Square, which wasn't built yet. And all the while, as the Great Wall was rebuilt and reinforced, Qi Qi Guang continued with intensive training of the troops under his command. And from this experience, especially during the winter of 1572, came the second military treatise that Qi Qi Guang was credited with, the Lianbing Shi Ji, a practical account of troop training. He had plenty of time to write this book. Compared to the excitement of facing down pirates in Zhejiang and Fujian, this project in the north of China, shoring up the defenses of the capital, was a quiet and peaceful job. Quiet, that is, until the Mongols started coming in force. Let me also mention, there were two figures who had Qi Qi Guang's back all this time. As I mentioned, the cost to carry out this Great Wall Enhancement project was staggering. As much as three-quarters of the imperial budget, there was very stiff 
opposition, but two people at Wan Li's court used their positions of influence to protect Qi Qi Guang and allow him to keep going. Besides Tan Lun, who I already mentioned, there was also the emperor's grand secretary, Zhang Ju Zheng. Like Qi Qi Guang, Zhang Ju Zheng is another major figure from Chinese history, but alas, not an A-lister. But in his role as the top bureaucrat in the government, who had the most influence and access to the Wanli emperor, he exercised a lot of power and accumulated a lot of wealth, too. And he had a lot of enemies. Tan Lun and Zhang Ju Zheng devoted every drop of their combined political capital to fortify the defenses and use Qi Qi Guang as a mechanism to institute training programs in the Jizhou area under his command. The idea was, if this whole thing worked well in Jizhou, the program could be rolled out nationally, and this would revitalize the Ming Dynasty. The expense to carry out this massive project really didn't sit well with his detractors in the Forbidden City. They never let up in their behind-the-scenes attacks against Qi's ongoing efforts to keep building these towers and training his troops into something other than what Alton Khan and his army were used to dealing with. The early success of Qi Qi Guang's Great Wall project and the results from all the training had already paid off. That kept the heat off of him for a while. As long as Minister of War Tan Lun and the Grand Secretary Zhang Ju Zheng were in his corner... He was untouchable. Well, the late Ming Dynasty, despite being able to keep the Mongol menace at bay, was still in a terrible decline. The Wanli Emperor reigned a long time. Forty-eight years. He's remembered for a few things. His Dingling tomb and the botched excavation that occurred during the Great Leap Forward, as well as his famous refusal to do his job for the second half of his reign, which did wonders for hastening the decline of the dynasty's fortunes. But actually, for the first half of his reign, he was a hands-on emperor who put his seal of approval on a few efforts that almost, but not quite, brought the Ming dynasty back to its glory days. This was all due to Grand Secretary Zhang Ju Zheng, who had also acted as Wan Li's regent during his minority. As long as he had the emperor's ear, he had his full support. And with this support, Zhang was able to keep Qi Qi Guang up in Jizhou, managing the Great Wall Reconstruction Project. But first, Tan Lun died in 1577, and Zhang Ju Zheng five years later in 1582. And with those two pillars of support gone from the scene, and with their political enemies at court running these two and their legacy through the shredder a few times, Qi Qi Guang and his personal association with them, especially Zhang Ju Zheng, was now in the crosshairs. Once Zhang passed, it didn't take long for his enemies to not only put an end to the expensive Great Wall project, they destroyed Zhang Ju Zheng and went after his legacy as well. And part of his legacy was the success of Qi Qi Guang. And so they went after him too. And without his two benefactors to protect him anymore, the end came fast for Qi. Within half a year of Zhang Chu Zheng's passing in February 1583, with no chance given to defend himself, Qi Qi Guang was removed from his post. And those who surrounded the Wanli Emperor turned him against his one-time most trusted official, Zhang Chu Zheng. And despite all he had done for the empire during his career, they destroyed Qi Qi Guang. Let me quote author Ray Huang again from his book, quote, Gone with Qi Qi Guang was the empire's last opportunity to give its armed forces the minimal modernization needed to survive the new era. Three decades later, its army was to fight Nur Hatsi without the benefit of the tactics of Qi's mixed brigade. And once its inadequacy was exposed, the barricades of the Great Wall, also inadequately manned, were torn down here and there to make way for the invading Manchus. In the absence of necessary reforms on the part of the emperor, Manchu bannermen, who were able to adapt to China's agrarian base and bureaucratic management, proved to be a better replacement of the corrupt system of hereditary military households than 
anything that could be found south of the Great Wall. End quote. Within seven months of Zhang Zhizheng's passing, Qi Ji Guang was transferred to Guangdong province, which in these days might be seen as a promotion, but back then, not a very attractive posting. With his prospects looking bleak and his health in decline, Qi Ji Guang was allowed to resign in 1585. But in reality, he had been dismissed and censured. He went back to his hometown of Dengzhou, present-day Peng Lai, and died in disgrace in 1588. It took 30 years, but he was later rehabilitated. And today, as I said, he's part of the multitude of historic figures counted among China's cultural icons. As I said, he wasn't an A-lister from the history books, but we remember him for a nice, eclectic bunch of achievements. He didn't do it on his own, but he was chiefly responsible for putting an end to the pirate scourge on the East China coast in Zhejiang and Fujian. He wrote not one, but two military treatises that became required reading for the centuries that followed his death. And both books made it into the Qing Qianlong Emperor's Encyclopedia to End All Encyclopedias, the Si Ku Quan Shu. He made contributions to martial arts and incorporating martial arts into the military training regimen. He helped to preserve the Ming Dynasty's longevity through his work in training the flabby troops defending the capital. And that unforgettable look that defines the Great Wall of China with those towers and brick construction and how it follows the contours of the mountain landscape, that too came from Qi Ji Guang. And from his days down in Fujian, as the story goes, in 1562, the local people made these cakes with a hole in the center that could be sort of all strung together and carried in bulk by the soldiers to eat on the run. No need to set up camp and cook every night and give their positions away with the smoke from the fires. Then later, to commemorate Chi Chi Guang's spectacular victory against the pirates, this bing or cake was named after him and still enjoyed today. In Malaysia, they call them kompia. In Chinese, they're called guangbing for Chi Chi Guang. It's one of many Fuzhou specialties. Another thing I'll mention, it's sort of a legend, but Chi Chi Guang had a wife who henpecked him mercilessly, and he was supposedly petrified of her. She even left him when his career took a hard left turn. I'll file that under, who knows. There's a few of these legends associated with Chi Chi Guang and his wife. Well, if you never heard of him before, now you know. Remember him on your next Great Wall outing. Okay, let's allow the curtain to fall right here. Patreon.com. Search for me, Laszlo Montgomery, or China History Podcast, and pledge $3 to join my elite squad of patrons. Aside from keeping me and this humble podcast on life support, you'll get exclusive access to all kinds of interesting dirt from my past. Plus, you'll always know what topics are queued up and get early access to those shows. Patreon.com. The link is in the show notes. Once again, this is Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, Cali, wishing you well and thanking you for listening and hoping you'll consider coming back next time in two weeks for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.